And again, it's a pleasure to be uh, addressing uh, JNF folks. Um, I just um, saw you a couple of weeks ago in Denver, and then before that, we had this really massive. Uh, a, a Zoom call with hundreds of people, and even today, I see that we have a, a very impressive uh, audience. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to show you some slides. Uh, what I thought of doing in the next uh, couple of minutes is just to go very quickly over the challenges that Israel is facing, because um, as um, as we're almost two and a half months into the war, uh, there are uh, certain things that are becoming uh, clearer. Uh, as we um, as we move along. So the first thing that I would say is that um, the the perspective of time is has changed. If uh, in the beginning, uh, many Israelis felt that um, the goals set by the Israeli leadership, by the Israeli army, are within reach, uh, you know, within a number of, of months, um, it looks more like a generational effort, meaning that this is, uh, is beginning to look at uh, as something that will take many, many years to accomplish. And I'll, I'll explain exactly what is it that will take many years uh, to accomplish. But uh, uh, the events of October 7th are uh, events of biblical proportions. And, he, and just as it took lower Manhattan 15 years to recover from 9-11, uh, it will take uh, Israel's uh, southern and northern regions uh, perhaps the same amount of time, if not more, uh, to recover, and and I didn't even begin to address the issue of, of, of what impact this would have on the design and the structure of the army, what impact this will have on the political system or the Israeli social psyche. Um, one thing is, uh, is clear. Uh, the window is closing on the possibility of seeing the release of the hostages. And the reason for it is of obviously because of the uh, the fact that the paradigm uh, shifted very quickly uh, within three, four weeks uh, from the beginning of the war from a positioning where Israel was clearly the victim, the world was exposed to those incomprehensible atrocities and this incomprehensible pre-civilizational level of brutality, the story shifted very quickly in historical terms to the story of Israel's response in Gaza. As a result, Israel is facing mounting international diplomatic and geopolitical pressure to either announce a ceasefire or provide the enemy with humanitarian aid. And that is, of course, uh, decreasing the incentive that Hamas leadership has to free the hostages. Israel is de facto losing its leverage over Hamas leadership, and therefore the window, sadly and tragically, is closing, uh, and I believe that the coming days will be critical uh, to the fate and the future of the hostages. As I mentioned before, the international pressure is mounting, uh, and here I'd like very quickly to go over the, the list of countries that are at play. Obviously, there are many more countries that have a stake that are, that are not included here, like Germany, Italy, even Argentina, Brazil, even countries like Nigeria. Are, are have a stake Turkey certainly, but these are really the main player in red. I uh, the, the those who are extremely hostile, in green those who are, uh, oh visibly favorable to Israel's position, in yellow is a country very peculiar, case of France that started uh, with the you know is a very staunch supporter. Emmanuel Macron actually physically came was one of the first leaders that physically came to Israel to show his solidarity with Israeli people. And given the, the really b b b tragic history that the French people had with Islamism and jihadism on French soil, um, it's very strange that uh, France, uh, in many ways, we lost the support of France diplomatically. And this is something that I think that Israeli leadership will have to answer to the Israeli people at one point. How did that happen? We need France also for the developing scenario in Lebanon, which we will talk about also during my very brief presentation. Uh, so Israel's challenge in that particular angle of the effort is the, the need to build an international coalition to support Israel's next steps. Let me give you an example. What does it mean to build 
an international coalition. The United States has decided to engage the Houthis. Houthi is another terrorist organization based in Yemen. It's an Iranian proxy organization that is uh, firing missiles, uh, targeting uh, assets, strategic assets to both Saudi Arabia and Israel in the Red Sea. The Americans uh, are present in the Red Sea, and they were able to successfully, and I must say in a very impressive way, intercept those missiles uh, fired by the Houthis. But look at what the Americans did. It was announced two days ago. The Americans were able to recruit and solicit the support of no less than 20 countries in their war against the Houthis. This is what Israel needs to do. Obviously, it's not happening. It's not happening because the Israeli leadership is preoccupied with managing the battle itself, in, in especially in the south, but also the evolving battle in the north. But it is a critical component of the success of Israel is the ability to build an international umbrella of diplomatic support for the next steps. What will be the next steps? Uh, if there's one thing that we learned from October 7th is that we cannot live like that. We cannot allow a jihadist, genocidal, Islamist organization to develop military cap capabilities along our border not in the south with Hamas and not in the north with Hezbollah. Certainly when Iran is rushing to develop nuclear military capability, in addition to their conventional military capabilities that are quite impressive, these are the three big problems that we have to handle. We must handle. We must handle Hamas and Hezbollah immediately. This is the short term. Longer term, we must handle the issue of Iran. Now, the big question is, and this is why we need to build the international diplomatic umbrella, who will help us in this effort? Is the United States, whoever is going to be in the White House in 2024, 2025, is it going to be India? Is it going to, who will help us in this effort? Is it going to be Germany, United Kingdom, France? We're looking here at a generational effort. Remember this statement that I'm just making. It's a generational effort. This is not something that we can fix in a couple of months of, of, of war. We have the issue of displaced Israelis. This is not something that you will hear about in the American mainstream media. We have hundreds of thousands of Israelis that left their homes in the South. JNF knows that very well because you are dedicated to working and nurturing Israel's, what we call in Hebrew, periphery. The regions in the South, the regions in the North. You know how many people left their homes. Now, it's important that we all understand that these people will not go back to their homes unless the Israeli government will be able to guarantee 1,000% their safety. And therefore, it becomes imperative, it becomes critical, acutely critical for Israel to handle the issue of Hamas and Hezbollah in their foreseeable timetable, in the foreseeable future, and then take care of the issue of Iran, which is really the source of inspiration, the source, the ideological foundation for everything that we see right now um, uh, on the ground. But the issue of displaced Israelis is not discussed enough. Maybe it's one of the things that we can do together um, as a result of this gathering. The task of rebuilding the South, I know that the JNF is deeply involved in the planning stages. But again, as I mentioned before, rebuilding is a massive, monumental task. It will cost billions and billions and billions of dollars. But more importantly, it would require a strategic long-term approach to the rebuilding of the South. What are we looking at here? We're talking about an estimated five to 10 years of a period that will be devoted to economic recovery. The travel industry uh, was hit the hardest and is expected to uh, suffer 
the most from what's happening. Uh, remember, uh, everybody's talking about Israeli high tech. Israeli high tech does not employ more than 300,000 people. But the Israeli travel industry is employing over 1 million people. In fact, it's closer to 1.2 million Israelis are employed in the Israeli travel industry. And we believe that it will take between two to three years, provided that the war will end at one point, two to three years from the moment the war ends, for tourism to recover. And remember, the last precedent, you were all involved, second intifada, from 2000 to 2005, tourism to Israel went down practically to zero. Zero. I remember when the intifada just broke down, hotel rooms in Jerusalem were completely empty. It will take us years to recover from that. The projected government deficit for 2024 is 110 billion shekels, which is 70 billion shekels more than the original projection before the war. This is the real cost of the war. Uh, the government is more likely, obviously, to raise taxes at one point, whether this government, the next government, 2024, 2025, certainly 2026, usually when you do that, in order to pay to cover the deficit, you need to print money. When you print money, just as it happened in the Western world during COVID, what happens when you print money? You inject tons of money into the economy, inflation goes up. So 2024, 2025 will also be marked probably most likely with high rate of inflation. Here's the challenge. In Israel, just as in New York after 9-11, they realized that rebuilding rather than fixing is what needs to be done. In other words, I'm not so sure that those communities that were hurt in some cases almost completely destroyed will have to be rebuilt the same way. Maybe it will have to be rebuilt in a very different way, just as, again, as they did in, um, in Ground Zero. Good news is it looks like the tech sector is demonstrating an exceptional level of resilience, and there are many, many indicators uh, to support that the tech sector will continue, even in times of trouble, to be that uh, sector that carries the Israeli economy um, on its back. Another thing that um, I would add to the list of challenges, you see, you have to see, you have to understand the Israeli army traditionally was designed uh, to fight for four or five weeks maximum. Um, the main body of soldiers are reservists, like my son, who's right now in Gaza. Uh, we talk about hundreds of thousands of reservists and a relatively small active duty military. The thinking was that uh, we would need to fight wars that were similar to the 73, 67 war, maybe 82. But the kind of war that we're engaged in right now, in urban setting with a non-state actor, Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, requires a different kind of military doctrine, more based on longevity, attrition, less on surprising the enemy, and of course, less on using uh, only um, um, military power that is uh, uh, deployed by the Air Force or by the artillery. Uh, to be more specific, we would need to look at the target, at the goal differently. When the Israeli government said at the very beginning, we are going to eradicate Hamas of the face of this earth. Um, the danger of such a statement is that when you are making such a promise, the danger is that you'll be over-promising and by definition, you'll be bound to under-deliver. Because Hamas, as I mentioned before, and I certainly mentioned in, in Denver, Hamas is an idea. It's almost impossible to eradicate an idea, just as we did not eradicate the idea behind the caliphate of ISIS or the Islamic Brothers or, or Al-Qaeda. Um, and there is a different way to look at it. It is to say, well, we realize that Hamas is an idea, is, a, is an ideological Islamist movement, um, and we cannot kill the idea. But what we can do 
is significantly cripple its military capacity, which is exactly what the Israel Defense Forces are trying to do right now in Gaza. The problem with that is, again, we need more time. It's not so easy. As I mentioned, there are no easy fixes. We need at least more, two or three more months uh, of, of intense fighting in Gaza in order to significantly eliminate the military capacity of Hamas. And hopefully that would um, uh, result in the expulsion of the leadership of Hamas uh, from Gaza to a, um, a different place. The IDF itself has to, as I mentioned, design itself, rebuild itself to fight longer wars in multiple fronts. Keep in mind that the big cities and Israel's strategic assets like airports, seaports, energy plants will become the new home front in case of multiple fronts. Hezbollah is much more dangerous than Hamas. They have precision missiles. They have missiles with 450 kilos of explosive warheads, uh, far more dangerous than Hamas. And so the war will be longer. Home front will be the new, the new front, multiple fronts. Hezbollah from the north, Hamas from the south, possibly pro-Iranian militias in the Golan Heights, possibly those of you who've been to my house know where I live, possibly pro-Iranian, pro-Hamas groups in the West Bank attacking Jewish communities along the fence, just like where I live, and possibly Israeli Arabs joining in. This is really the Iranian scenario. This is, if you may, the Iranian fantasy. The IDF has a problem of ammunition. We don't have enough ammunition to fight a war that is so long. We need help in that department. And the help, of course, will come from our allies, number one, from the United States. And in case we are engaged in, in multiple fronts, we would need a new weapon systems. We would need we would need the type of ammunition we don't have right now to deal with the threat posed by both Hezbollah and Iran. Um, one uh, positive, a big positive, is that um, unlike uh, what's happening on campus in the United States, where the TikTok generation, Gen Z, is being ridiculed for their insane position um, on Hamas, uh, the Israeli TikTok generation actually is a very pleasant surprise. Uh, the Israeli TikTok generation is fighting with extraordinary bravery, uh, with extraordinary camaraderie. The morale is high, high spirits. The people are united. They're galvanized. Um, I hear from my son stories about, you know, the the, the camaraderie. It's just, it, it's fun to hear. It's fun to hear because, because you, you, you know, many of us were concerned about this generation, uh, about the fact that they spent way too much time in front of their smartphones or their tablets uh, played too many video games, um, but the truth is that when you know, in the moment of truth, um, they were able to rise to the occasion in a very big way, and I think we can all be very proud of them, of this younger generation. And I believe that the leadership, the new leadership of Israel, will come from that generation. The new leadership that will take Israel to new heights will come from that generation. Obviously, my generation is too old. Um, we see a very uh, disturbing erosion in the trust the Israelis have in the political system. It doesn't matter where you're from, the entire system is being held as responsible, not only for the, for the uh, failure, the military failure, but also the conceptual failure, the doctrine that said we would be better off cultivating and nurturing Hamas than dealing with the Palestinian Authority, which was the main reason for the calamity of October 7th. Surprisingly, surprisingly, despite of the fact that the army is de facto responsible for the failure, the military operational failure on October 7th, the level of trust in the leadership of the army is not eroding. And the reason is because they assumed responsibility and they did the right thing. They stood in front of the Israeli public and they said, we failed, we are responsible, we will answer all the questions. We will investigate what needs to be investigated, but let's do that after the military phase ends. And lastly, I would say on my list of challenges is of course, Israel has to extend <clears throat> its help to Jewish communities all over the world um, because of the rise 
uh, of anti-Semitism and hate crimes in general. Everybody's talking about what's happening in on U.S. campus, but uh, we we have a tendency to forget com other communities that are at real risk. I was just on the phone with my cousin in South Africa. I think that South Africa today is perhaps the most dangerous place for Jews, uh, you know, in the entire world, uh, because in South Africa is an institutional support for Hamas by the South African government. Imagine then on October 7th, the Minister of Interior of the South African government called her Hamas counterpart, asking them if they need help after the atrocities and the massacre of October 7th. She called Hamas. She did not call Israel. Uh, so, But certainly anti-Semitism is a big issue that affects us as well, not just uh, American Jews, North American Jews, European Jews, and Jews all over the world, but it's cer certainly something that we need to address, especially, especially we would need to invest heavily, heavily in what people mistakenly call PR. It's not really PR, it's called positioning. Uh, and, and I'll just say this as an answer to a question that I know that someone wants to answer. How, how come Israel has such poor public relations? It's not that Israel has poor, poor public relations. It's that Israel lost the position of the victim in the conflict. And we lost that position in 1982. Clearly, 48, 56, 67, 73, Israel was clearly the victim. And we enjoy the sympathy of the world because the world and people are programmed to sympathize with the underdog in any and every conflict, even in a sporting event. You always want to sympathize with the underdog. This is why we love babies. This is why we love puppies. In 1982, Israel engaged in the first ever war that changed that paradigm. And from being the victim, we were perceived by the world in Lebanon as the victimizer. That happened under the leadership of Menachem Begin and Ariel Sharon. That was the last time Israel enjoyed the position, I say enjoy quote unquote, the position of the underdog in the eyes of the world. And it's been, ever since, it's been downhill. You had the first intifada, the second intifada, and all those rounds of violence with the with the Hamas in Gaza and so on and so forth. The, the imagery coming out of Gaza is dominating the world. You can send as many brilliant spokespersons as you want, but one image of a suffering boy in Gaza, uh, um, you know, tells a different story and it's very difficult to change. How do you change that? As, as I mentioned in Denver, and I will end right here and open this for your questions. Uh, obviously, long term, you need to invest in the silent majority and the majority of the people that really don't care, don't know much about the conflict. This is what we need to do. Give them the immune system so that they will know when the toxicity is thrown at them. When someone says Israel is performing a genocide in Gaza, or Israel is an apartheid state, that they'll be in a position to say, don't tell me that. I know Israel. I learned about Israel. I was exposed to Israelis, or better yet, I've been to Israel. Don't tell me that Israel is, is apartheid. I know Israel, and Israel is not apartheid. And it's our responsibility to give the 70, 80% silent majority that immune system, which we failed to do. We failed to do as a state of Israel. We failed to do that. This is this has been my my life mission, and 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 it didn't happen. It didn't happen because the Israelis were too self-centered. They didn't understand the magnitude of the task. But October seventh made it clear: if we will not take care of the well-being of Israel's reputation, reputational security is part and parcel with national security. It's not just about tanks. It's not just about airplanes. It's also about our reputation. Your questions, please. You know, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your insights. You've actually answered a number of the questions that were forwarded to me uh, in your remarks as you were speaking. Um, one question, though, I do want to throw out, which is a summation of a number of questions, is understanding the continued support for the IDF, um, but what you're finding in the lack of polling support for the government, um, and I don't want to get political here, um, what does that mean for the future of the IDF going forward? You know, governments rise and fall. Those are some of the comments we've seen. But what can the IDF do to ensure that commitment by Israelis, and particularly young Israelis, continue? 
You know, by the way, the uh, erosion in the trust in the political system is across the board. Uh, they, it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, obviously, the government takes, the sitting government takes most of the blame. But the idea of traditionally and historically has always been the best pool of talent for Israeli leadership. Um, and then you, and uh, I mean, I can go on and, uh, you know, it started with the Haganah that was before the IDF. And after 48, it was the IDF. It was the place where all the leaders came from, uh, you know, from Moshe Dayan, Yitzhak Rabin, and so on, all the way to Ehud Barak and others. And so uh, we have great people in the IDF. These are honest, hardworking people. The main reason why people, the trust in the political echelon eroded is the same thing that is happening throughout the Western world. Politicians are being perceived as self-centered, narcissistic, all about themselves. So politics became a politics, you know, the politics of people that came to take rather than to give. And post-October 7th, Israelis have no patience anymore for leaders that come to politics to take, whether they're taking money or, uh, you know, respect or honor or all sorts of perks and privileges. They want politics of people that came to give. And you find these people in the army in the military, in the in the government, the civil service in general. And so I think that's the reason, if you ask me, because I ask myself, how come people don't, you know, they clearly the army failed here on October 7th. How come the trust in the, the in the leadership of the army hasn't eroded? And I think that's the answer. Uh, they know that these people, they may have made a mistake, but they're in it because they believe in the mission, just like you guys. You're in it, you know, nobody's forcing you to do what you're doing, but you're in it because you believe in the mission of the JNF. And that's, that's, that makes the whole difference.